Thank you very much indeed for those uh, very kind uh, words of welcome. Uh, it really is a, a huge pleasure to be here, um, and uh, it was no exaggeration to say that uh, I was absolutely thrilled and delighted that this uh, last week's meeting was postponed, not least because it gave me the opportunity to tell my office, uh, which can't really get its head around the fact that I'm in Israel, that I was delayed in Israel because of snow. Um, uh, this confirms their view that uh, there's something very much wrong with me. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the themes of my book, uh, Londonistan, and I hope you can all uh, hear me uh, if I speak at this level. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the themes of my book, Londonistan, which was published in America in May and in uh, Britain in June. Um, and since then, various things have happened, uh, which have given it an extra uh, dimension, um, and I'm going to reflect in what I say to you this evening, uh, some of that uh, perspective given by the last uh, few months. Uh, I wrote Londonistan as a warning, as I believe that Britain was very deeply in denial over the threat of radical Islamism. And despite a perceptible change in public mood in Britain over the past few months, I believe this is still the case. Many in Britain are still, in my view, blind to the nature and scale of what is being attempted by the Islamic Jihad, and also to the possibility that it might succeed principally because of this state of denial. Now, you may be wondering about this term, Londonistan. Londonistan was a term of abuse coined by the French Secret Service. Uh, London, as in London, capital of Britain, is Stan as a mocking reference to Afghanistan where Al-Qaeda uh, was training. Um, and the French coined this to describe the fact that in their view, uh, Britain uh, was turning a blind eye uh, to the fact that it had become the, 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 the principal hub of al-Qaeda uh, terrorism in Europe during the 1990s. A truly fantastic state of affairs, and my book is about the kind of culture in Britain that has allowed this to, that allowed this to happen. But to me, the term Londonistan, and the reason why I called my book Londonistan, is that it doesn't just reflect uh, something that happened in the 1990s, this phenomenon of uh, Britain's role in al-Qaeda terrorism per se. To me, Londonistan is also a state of mind where people not only seek to appease, but to a large extent come to believe and absorb the ideas and assumptions, or at least many of them, of the enemy that intends to destroy them. This state of mind, Londonistanism, if you like, is a state of mind that applies, in my view, not just to Britain, not just to Europe, but also to sections of America and to sections of Israel. Throughout the free world, people are refusing to face up to the reality of the jihad because, among other things, they can't bring themselves to accept what must follow, not least for their own behavior and the behavior of their society. It's so much easier to take refuge in alternative explanations, not least ones that blame themselves for their own victimization. It's much easier to blame yourself or your own government or your own society, which basically in a democracy you can change, at least in theory, uh, than it is uh, to uh, identify a threat which is something which you can't easily get a handle on at all. And just as these people embrace their enemies, so they turn against their allies in Britain, particularly how they have turned against, Britain, against America and Israel. They refuse to accept that we are in the throes of a holy war waged upon the Western world, in my view, for more than 25 years, with Israel, you might think, the proxy target well before that, without our even recognizing that it is a holy war, because it doesn't fit our definition of a war, which we assume is a war between states. This, in my view, is a world war being fought in many disparate theatres with many proximate and different causes, but all with one single coherent aim, to defeat Western civilization, to establish Islam as the dominant power in the world, and to restore the medieval Islamic caliphate. Looking back, it's clear to me that a key development was when Ayatollah Khomeini established his theocracy in Iran and declared his intention at that point uh, in uh, 1979 to wage war upon the West and to subjugate it to Islam. This was largely ignored at the time in the West. 
This uh, arrival of uh, the theocracy in, his, in, in Iran, it, looking back, we can see that, among other things, it ignited political Islamism around the world. It gave rise, in turn, to the rival Wahhabi version in Saudi Arabia, and it exported the notion of Islamic rule, the goal of Islamic rule, as a global project. At the same time that this radicalization was happening, and this radicalized a lot of British Muslims who previously had been very quiescent, but saw in Iran the example of what might be achieved elsewhere. At the same time that this radicalization was happening, Britain and Europe were experiencing a mass influx of Muslims, and among others, as borders in Europe opened and the poor south of the world migrated en masse to the more prosperous north. The problem was that unlike other immigrant groups, successive generations of Muslims have failed to integrate into Western societies and instead try to colonize their host countries, a program for Europe that was explicitly laid out by the Muslim Brotherhood more than 20 years ago, but today is unknown and uh, ignored and even uh, repudiated by people uh, in the non-Muslim world who refuse to believe it. We can see the outcome. From Britain, we look across the channel at the daily violence in the French suburbs, sanitized by the French government, but described by French police as a permanent intifada in France, in the similar violence going on in Belgium, in the murder of Theo van Gogh in the Netherlands, and the terrorization of Dutch politicians who speak out, in the global riots, kidnappings, and murders after the republication of the Danish Mohammed cartoons, and in the fact that the British Security Service is now monitoring, according to its own measurements, some 30 terrorist plots by British Muslims against the British state, with 1,600 known British Islamic terrorists, most of them British Muslims in Britain, trying to get hold of a nuclear or dirty bomb to use against their fellow <coughs> countrymen. Little of this, however, in Britain is reported. And when it is, it is generally presented as the fault of those being terrorized. Thus, the French riots are blamed on French prejudice towards immigrants, the cartoon riots on media insensitivity towards Muslim feelings in publishing, in publishing the cartoons, and recent riots in Royal Windsor, of all places, not a place hitherto uh, co uh, commonly associated with uh, social mayhem and deprivation and poverty and all these other things that uh, we are led to believe cause Islamic rage. Royal Windsor called Royal Windsor because it's where Her Majesty the Queen has one of her many houses or palaces, as we call them in Britain. Um, in Royal Windsor, after a Muslim owner of a dairy tried to call his dairy, which he had renamed the Medina Dairy, which might give some people a clue as to his project, he tried to turn the Medina Dairy into a mosque, and where worshippers in this unlawful mosque reportedly beat up local protesters, which caused, in turn, fairly major riots over a series of four days, riots which were hardly reported at all by the British media, and where they were reported, it was reported as white racists attacking innocent Muslims. Now, in Britain, there certainly are many innocent Muslims, as there are around the world, and there are those who are truly moderate. But this immediately poses a question. What is a moderate Muslim? In Britain, it appears that only those who openly endorse the murder of fellow Britons are not moderate. Those who endorse the murder of Israelis or coalition forces in Iraq are merely exercising resistance and so are classified as moderate, even admirable. Worse still, there is an alarming number of Muslims in Britain whose views are not moderate by any reasonable definition, even though they may abhor violence, genuinely so. For example, opinion polls suggest that between 40 and 60% of British Muslims would like to live under Sharia law in Britain, Almost a quarter say the 7-7 suicide bombings in Britain can be justified because of the war on terror. Nearly half think 9-11 was a conspiracy between the US and Israel. 46% think the Jewish community is, quotes, in league with the Freemasons to control the media and police. And 37% think the Jewish community in Britain is a legitimate target, whatever that means, quote, as part of the ongoing struggle for justice in the Middle East. I see all this as a continuum of extremism, which acts as a conveyor belt to terror. What I mean by this is that even those on this continuum of extremism who don't support violence may endorse uh, ideas such as hatred of the West, of Jews or Americans, or paranoid theories of victimization or grievance, and that those ideas are the drivers of terror. 
But the Western liberal mind refuses to accept that such ideas are extreme. This is because the iron orthodoxy of multiculturalism and minority rights holds that it is axiomatically a racist act to condemn a minority belief or value system, whatever it may say. That's why throughout the West, the left now takes the part of those preaching hatred or murder to which inconvenient truths it simply closes its eyes because it is being preached or taught by minorities. Britain has now, under the impact of all of this, begun to question the doctrine of multiculturalism, which it blames for segregated communities. However, segregation is not actually the issue. The 7-7 bombers, for example, British Muslims, born and raised in Britain, le leading apparently exemplary lives, looking after children, disabled animals, and so on. They went to ordinary British schools and then to university, where, in fact, many British Muslims are radicalized. It was the 7-7 seven -seven suicide bombings themselves which produced a great spike in terrorist recruitment. Because what Britain and all the other Western faint hearts fail to grasp is that the greatest single driver of terrorism is terrorism, or to be more precise, the demoralized reaction to it. For decades, Arab and Muslim terror has been principally fueled, in my view, not by poverty or by oppression or by dispossession, but by the fact that it works. That's why the middle class Hindu convert to Islam, Diran Barot, who was recently jailed in Britain for plotting synchronized atrocities, including the use of poison and radioactive bombs, said the reason terrorism was, in his words, an Islamic religious duty was that, quote, terror works. That's because Britain, Europe, Israel, and until 9-11 America have all responded to unending Arab and Muslim terror over several decades by seeking to understand, to accommodate, or to appease the demands behind it. The greater the terror, the greater the self-flagellation of its victims. That's why it works. Now, Britain doesn't get this at all. Unable to grasp that what is driving this onslaught is religious fanaticism, the response of Britain's political and security establishment has been to appease. It's a great British instinct. It's a great British export appeasement. Britain's post-colonial mindset means it thinks all terrorism must be caused by discrete, specific geopolitical grievances. For example, Iraq. For example, Israel-Palestine. The way to end Islamist terror, therefore, in this view, is to end these disputes around the world. In my view, this is precisely the wrong way around. The way to end these disputes is first to end Islamist terror. But our establishment in Britain refuses to accept that this is a religious war. To do so, it says, would be to stigmatize all Muslims. But this is a complete non sequitur. Many Muslims, indeed, do not subscribe to these murderous ideas. In, in fact, Muslims are, I think, the most numerous victims of the jihad worldwide. But even so, we cannot begin to understand what we are all up against unless we acknowledge that it is a global war fought in the name of Islamic conquest and the subjugation of unbelievers through both violent and cultural means. However, the British government's strategy instead to combat Muslim extremism seeks to tackle its underlying causes which it defines as its own foreign policy, discrimination and poverty. In other words, it's all Britain's fault that it keeps being bombed. So instead of challenging the paranoid and completely false grievance culture that's actually driving this terror, the government in Britain has chosen to endorse it and to appease Islamist radicalism. So, for example, now we have Sharia-compliant mortgages, we have a blind official eye turn to polygamy and to the forced marriage, in quotes, of 14-year-old girls, and the police deciding to make their intelligence available to the Muslim community before undertaking anti-terror anti raids. 